Okay, today I have a, a very special treat. Uh, we are going to have our first three-timer on the podcast. Uh, he, he's been on twice before. His name's Gregory Taylor. I'm sure you know him. He's one of my best friends. He's a performer with me in uh, a number of different environments and groups. Um, but he also has some unique uh, background and some unique things that he does that I want to delve into a little bit more. And um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to dive in a little bit onto his experiences being a radio broadcaster. He's run the same radio show on WORT uh, for going on 30 years. Is that right, Gregory? Yeah, pretty much. There's, uh, I think, maybe two hiatuses where my wife got a Fulbright or a sabbatical, and I went abroad. But apart from that, yeah, since about 1986 or 1985, 1986, yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about it is because an awful lot of has changed in the musical environment between uh, then and now. And so what I'd like to do is, first of all, I think people that uh, imagine being a radio star as being kind of a cool thing, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started? Sure. Um, Well, for one thing, it's not something uh, that I ever intended to do. In fact, uh, prior to my arrival in Madison, I think the sum total of my radio experience involved uh, locking myself out of a student radio station while the second side of, there was an old Poco record that had like a whole side of stuff, and I went to get a Coke and locked myself out of the station, and it ran the runoff lock groove for four hours because I couldn't get janitors to unlock the station. That was my beginning broadcasting thing, and it's pretty ignominious. When I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, after my wife got uh, got her first academic job, I was pretty well ensconced in what we would think of as cassette culture. In fact, we we talked a little bit about that, and I th- I think the first time that you and I talked, maybe. Yep. Um, so I had a collection of work with me, and I found out that we had a community radio station in town. Uh, that's a little bit different than public radio, and if you like, we can maybe go into the difference. But basically, the idea was I thought, oh, cool, there's a radio station in town. Maybe I'll take some things down. And uh, maybe they'll play my music on the air. That would be awesome. Because I'd had a little, I'd gotten some airplay, particularly WNYC in New York. Uh, John Schaefer had been very kind to me in a lot of, uh, during the 80s. And uh, so I took some down to the station and uh, dropped them off, said hello to the uh, woman who was then the music director, gave her a bunch of things, and she said, you know, I'll be glad to listen to these and uh, give you a call in a while. I thought, great, went home, everything was fine, and... She called me up a couple of weeks later and asked me to come down to the station. And, yeah, I wasn't really sure what was going on, but I went down anyway, and we talked about the work, and she said, you know, this is really interesting, it's really fun. We've got a couple of shows that this would be really interesting for. And I discovered in the course of that conversation that she wasn't actually, as the music director, she wasn't telling people what to play. What she was basically doing was being kind of a gatekeeper and passing stuff along to people who either would or wouldn't decide to play it, which was a little bit of a surprise. That was something I really wasn't aware of doing. But the thing that she really said was she kind of, uh, you know, poured me a poured me a glass of wine down in her office downstairs and pushed back from the, the table for a little bit and said, uh, but, you know, I wanted to know if you'd be interested, uh, if you ever thought of doing a radio program. And I said, no, actually, I never thought about doing that. And she said, well, would you be willing to consider, do, do you think you could do like a, a couple of hours worth of radio? And I said, well, do I have to talk a lot or anything like that? And she just, uh, this was kind of a mystifying answer, but she said, you can do whatever you like. It's two hours. Just don't say any of the seven bad words and you can play anything you want. Do you think you could do a two hour show? And I said something like, yeah, I guess I could do one, maybe. And she said, oh, great. Because basically what had happened was they were in a situation where there was a person that did a great experimental show. I'd listened to him already, actually, since I got in town. Bill Milas, the show is called System Considerations. It was this magnificent experimental radio program. Uh, And uh, Bill, of course, had to be away once in a while. He'd be sick. He'd be on vacation. So the question was, could I do that? So I said, yeah, I can only do one show. 
And uh, the music director said, okay, that's all you need, just one show. And then when you finish doing the one show, think about doing another one. So I went home and I puzzled and I sweated and I just laugh now to think about how hard I worked on it. The very first rate, I can tell you what the first show I did was. The first show I did was dedicated entirely to music released on Brian Eno's obscure music label. <laughs> because I thought that would be like a total winner. So I just, I just agonized over like what pieces to choose and what order to put stuff in. And that was my first show. And uh, the first time I went in, in those days, you had to be, there was a certification process to basically run the board and be on the air and stuff. So I had someone do that for me, and all I did was just blabbed. I thought I talked way too much. But uh, the woman that ran the station called me back and said, that was wonderful. Uh, I think you should think about doing another show now. So I went home and I agonized over I think it was a show composed entirely of women because we were coming up on Women's History Month or something like that. And I thought, maybe he'll be away that month. But anyway, so, and that's how it started. So when uh, those of you out there listening think about the idea of doing radio for somewhere between 20 and 30 years, please don't think of it as doing something for 20 or 30 years. Think of it uh, in the way that you think of making your own work. You do one piece after another, and you concentrate on the piece that's in front of you, and after enough time, you've been on the radio for so long that it's really frightening. And that's kind of, that's how it started. Um, at some point, they decided they wanted to do, uh, there, was, uh, there was an issue with uh, the programming that came directly before the show being a sort of like a world music show, back before world music meant global pop. And uh, there were three different programmers, because this is community radio, so the programmers are all volunteers, and they play the things that they love. And then uh, Bill's show would be, you know, more conceptually rigorous stuff. And, and they looked at the Arbitrons and realized that people would, like, either turn off the radio at 8.01, or they'd turn it on at 7.59. And the person who was then the music director said, well... Um, there's going to be a hole opening up in a couple of weeks, and we were wondering if you'd think about doing a show that would like start out uh, kind of nice, like the world music shows are, and then get creepy and weary and scary and weird at the end of two hours. Could you do that? <laughs> so suddenly, I didn't a have challenge. to have any. I had. No, I didn't have to have good ideas for show content. Right. All I had to do was to go from nice to creepy and scary. And uh, I said, well, yeah, I guess I could do that. And then uh, that's how my show was born. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so there's some other issues. I mean, uh, in those days, everybody on the station had cool on-air names. Right. And right. I couldn't think of any names for myself that didn't sound stupid. Mongo, King of the Universe, it's just that sort <laughs> of stuff. And right. I also couldn't think of any good names for the show that wouldn't sound totally stupid. Uh -huh. So, um, I, I, my first decision was I'm just going to use my first name, the short version of my first, just Greg. That's all I'm going to be. I'm not going to make any bones about being anybody I'm not. And I still couldn't think of the name of the show, so I got out my ob oblique strategies deck, and I shuffled the cards. And the first card I drew, and boy, I still think about this. The first card I drew said, remember those quiet evenings. Oh, Interesting. RTQE. Yep. RTQE. And I thought, you know, that's kind of what I think the show should maybe be about. It's some, you know, it's Sunday night, so people are trying to not think about the coming work day. They've put their kids to bed. They have a chance to just sort of sit back and do something other than worry. So I thought, oh, this is a perfect name for the show. And of course it's the night, it, it, but it was too long. Just saying, saying, remember those quiet evenings all, all the time in the middle of something when you met a radio show was really complicated. But this was the 1980s, so everything was an acronym. So it turned into RTQE, and it has been that ever since. Interesting. So that's how I got started. So now you talk about this being community radio. Could you explain what the difference is between community radio and, and what we normally think of as public radio? Oh, sure. And this is probably going to be a, a little bit uh, confusing for anybody listening who's not American. Okay. Um, community radio is differs from public radio in terms of its funding structure. For one thing, we don't get nearly as much money from the government, which has actually meant that we're, we haven't fallen on quite as serious or hard times as um, the federal government cutbacks for public radio have been, although there's still some trouble. 
Um, all the money you get from the government is a block grant based on the amount of money you raise already. And you can only use that money for things like full-time staff positions. So one of the big differences between community radio and public radio is that community radio is overwhelmingly driven by volunteers. And so what that pretty much means is that you have to raise, you know, one or two million dollars less a year because you're not paying programmers. Mm-hmm. On the other half, I'm not a I'm not a paid professional, nor have I been one for a very long time. Um, public radio is more uh, large blocks of programming, and and after um, various political factions in the United States decided to go after public radio for its perceived liberalism. Um, They've had to raise more money for things uh, related to, let's say, programming and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, my station has a staff that's uh, cut to the bone. I mean, there's there's really uh, there's really nothing more than a really competent, really dedicated staff that keeps the transmitters on and things like that. And the rest of us um, do the work because we love it. And I suppose I would say that that there's uh, there's certainly a political component to that. The earliest community radio stations in the uh, in the United States were havens for leftist leftist politics. KP, right. KPFK and and K, you know those stations out on the West Coast were direct descendants from that particular style of radio. Yeah, so that's kind of the big difference is that uh, community radio is volunteer driven. And that also means that we don't have... So things like programmers are really different. Uh, The programmers at our station never tell any of us what to play. What they do is wrangle data for uh, companies that provide us with promos and things like that. And they report playback and stuff like that. And with the Digital Morning Copyright Act, there's a few other things they have to do. But it's entirely volunteer-driven, which means one of the reasons I guess I stay is... Nobody's told me I have to leave. <laughs> I've continued to raise, you know, I've continued to raise money when we have to do fund. We do it like three times a year, right. but basically that's it. I every Sunday is a blank page. You so go in and say, what do I do this week? Yeah. So when you raise money, that literally goes to the radio station. And you don't get any of it. Oh, not a cent. No, right. no, 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 no. All right. Well, so then the question is, especially for. People who are like myself, who are terminally behind in paying bills. <laughs> um, why? What is the motivation for continuing to do it? I mean, it's nice to good say question. that I like doing it because nobody tells me what to do, but that's good for about three weeks of work. I'm yeah, I'm true. wondering what gets you going for thirty years worth. Hmm. Well, I suppose it would sound, it might sound a little bit silly, but I think one of the things that keeps me doing it, I would say there are two things. Uh, the first one is more, how do I say, ego-driven? I'm not sure what the word I want is. But, but basically, doing the program has, provi- has forced me to have to continue to listen. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you sometimes when you do work, you set goals for yourself or you, you create games for yourself whose outcome is supposed to be some desired goal. In my case, it's kept me having to listen to stuff. To, to greater or lesser extents, it's also forced me to listen to people whose work I respect more than I like. Oh, because right. since the radio station is, uh, since listener sponsors keep us on the air, Listener sponsors are people that you listen to, so it because you form you actually form relationships with them. One of the <laughs> things about the way my show has changed is I really don't talk in the air very much now because everybody is accustomed to the idea that they can call into the station and tell me what I'm doing wrong, <laughs> ask me about the record that I've done right. My relationships have switched to these. Uh, telephone things right. to my considerable surprise because I used to have to play longer pieces when I was on the air 15 or 20 years ago because if I played something people liked I'd have to be on the phone at the same time I was announcing right because there's no one else in the state it's Sunday night there's no one else in the station right, of course um, the other thing about it though and this sounds a little more highfalutin than I'm comfortable being but I would say that as a listener 
when I think about when I think about the way that new things entered my life, a lot of it is tied up with um, personal relationships, a very certain kind of it, a personal relationship with somebody who knew more than I did, and um, and when faced with somebody who was as sure of themselves and full of themselves as I was when I was younger. Instead of just deciding that I was a little idiot and I wasn't worth spending time with, I was surrounded by people who widened my universe by trying to explain to me why the things that I disliked or didn't know anything about mattered. And when I think about the person that I've become, I owe them a tremendous debt to the extent that I'm still in touch with them and and now actually now that I'm older to the extent that they're still alive I tell them that every single time that I talk to them and there are some of them that I can't pay back anymore and I see some of what I do I think of it as paying it forward finding something for somebody that they've never heard before because I the visceral excitement of that is something that you once you have the experience of it yourself, you want to give it to other people. You just do. Sure. Because it's, it's a great experience, period. So well, that's, that's probably fine. Yeah, that's, it's, it's cool that you say that because certainly one of the reasons that I tune into your show, and I, I listen to the streaming version of it often, one of the reasons that I listen to it is because so often I'll be introduced to things, either things that I've heard of and I'm – curious about you know i guess i could go on spotify but there's there's sort of this thing that's like i've heard of it but i wasn't compelled to search it out right and then when mm. all of a sudden you provide it to me i'm like oh that's really cooler oh i really hate that or ah i would you know that sounds like me on a good day or on a bad yeah. day or on a day when well I'm that was tripping a waste on of something. my time <laughs> right exactly <laughs> but um one of the things about doing my program that has changed and it took me a long time to realize why I'd done what I did, but I just it, it seemed like a habit at first is with a, with a couple of exceptions, I generally never tell people what I'm about to play. Hmm. That tends to come earlier. What I've basically kind of discovered was that um, often if you tell people what to play, their expectations will be more fixed. There'll be less of a sense of surprise. And in some cases, you can have that great call where you play something for someone and they say you know they'll call you up and say well this is awesome what's this and you'll say "Uh, it's john cage and then they'll just without even thinking about they'll say but i hate john cage (laughs) and you'll say you don't now do you right that's i mean that that's kind of sneaky but it's it's actually a lot of fun or the more recent one for me has been there's been a there's recently been a real spate of uh, reissues of very old electronic tape music from really from all over the world right. work from the 50s 60s and 70s for reasons I have yet to fully understand high school kids love it that's when I talk uh, I have no idea why that's when I talk to high school kids especially oh mono if it's mono, oh man, they love that, and they'll call up and say, "Wow, this is really great! What is this?" And you can just you can just sort of like hear the enthusiasm, and then you slowly work around to telling them that the person that did this piece of music could have dated their grandmother, right? You know, and it's like, I just wow. I'm sorry, I take such delight in that <laughs> idea that that what is uh, what is new? You know, a consequence of the internet being this giant source of music is what is new is not what is temporally novel anymore. Right. And exploiting that is, is great fun. And by not telling people ahead of time, you you sort of maximize that. And and well, since I'm in charge of the show, I get to I get to do it that way. There's a few exceptions to that rule. Oh well also the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, has a couple of provisions for webcasting that have made the that have made the transition from broadcasting to webcasting annoying. One of those uh, one of those rules is you're not supposed to tell you can't post a playlist ahead of time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So if I post if I when I post I have a mailing list when I post to my Facebook page about what's going to be on the on the air I have to do it in alphabetical order. Oh, interesting. Because wow. you can tell people what to expect without telling them when you're going to play it. 
Right. And oh. it's just the DMCA is a, it's got some really stupid rules. That's really but crazy. you don't you know, but it it doesn't bother me that much. Yeah. So one of the things that you said uh about naming your broadcast was that, you know, you were thinking, ah, oh, it's a great name because, you know, people are putting their kids to bed. But then you also, I mean, you hook me, and generally I don't care what my kids are doing. <laughs> and But you also talk about having young people calling you. And What is your audience? I mean, what's your oh. actual audience versus what you thought they might be? And Because it sounds like you interact with them a lot more than I would have expected. Oh, I, you do. Uh, that's a that's a consequence of community radio generally. Is the sense that if you have a community station in town, um, listener sponsors are accustomed to the idea that they have their stakeholders or they have something to say about what they're doing, and they also uh, have that privilege outside of the work that they listen to, right? So you know, so I'll occasionally get like. Um, uh, somebody who listens to the Dusty Storm Bluegrass show call up and complain about something or, or be impressed about something. So the idea is you, you really have to make a, a count of yourself. I know I, have, I know I have high school kids. And the reason I know that I have high school kids is without fail. I mean, it's really interesting. Every kind of um, end of the summer, I'll get a couple of calls from people whose voices I don't recognize. I don't know their name. I don't remember them from listener sponsor roles. And they'll call up and say, um, hi, this is, uh, this is uh, Darren, and uh, I'm going off to school. In, uh, I'm going to Columbia in the fall, and uh, I've got to leave town. And I just wanted to know, let you know that like, I've listened to your show since I was in about eighth grade because my dad used to have it on all the time. And uh, I just wanted you to know that uh, thanks. Wow. Which is, of course, always like it just pierces you through the heart. Right, of course. The other one that's really interesting is older listeners um, who are, uh, I didn't, you know, I thought everything the kids were doing today is crap. This is great. This sounds like, like silver mist. It, I played a, a Norwegian band called Elephant Nine, who right. do some work with uh, Rainer Fisk, who's um, Dunyan's guitar player. This, it's sort of great instrumental prog. And I had this guy call who was so happy that, you know, modern prog stuff is all that metal crap. And I can't believe there's still great stuff being done. And I was like, dude, this just came out. He was so happy. <laughs> so I know I have really young and really old listeners. I also know I have parents as listeners. Again, this is, this is, this is not scientific demographics. These are just people I know. I know I have parents because if I play something and someone's child falls asleep to it. <laughs> Seriously, I get called. You get, oh, oh I this thought you were really, like, you get endless requests for that same piece then. Oh, 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 <laughs> that, oh, believe me, believe me, that too. I totally do. Uh -huh. um, and, and I think part of my audience, I think part of my audience only listens to half my show. I think that I have an audience that um, turns the show on after they put their kids to bed. So I'm 9 to 11 o'clock. So I think I have an audience that turns on the radio at 10 o'clock because mm -hmm. the listener sponsor thing goes up after that. And I also think there are people who have it on for the first hour. So if I play anything like really loud and scratchy and scary at the beginning of the show, I'll hear about it because someone will call me up and say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Ashley is just like running a house in tight little circles now because that thing just whipped her into a frenzy. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> So, and uh, and I appear to meet my I appear to meet my fundraising goals. So I know, that, and I know that there are people who have listened to the program, and supported it um, for years and years and years. Uh, there are names that I certainly recognize. Yeah. Um, and occasionally, you know, I'll notice that one of them dies or something like that. Uh. But um, by virtue of the fact that my contact with my audience is just by. You know, they, unless they call me, I don't know who they are. I also have uh, noticed that I've begun getting pledges for on-air fundraising for people who do not live in our broadcast area. Right. Uh, San Francisco, I have a, I have a faithful listener uh, in Australia who apparently, who I believe listened to my program when I was, uh, when he was in the United States and uh, now grades papers 
on Monday morning in Australia listening to my show. Oh, wow. Which I think is kind of cool. That is very cool. I mean, you know, I guess I should be making crap loads of money and and spending my evenings in the champagne room. But you know what? (laughs) That's really satisfying to me personally. Well, but it also brings up a point because, as you suggest, the Internet... The existence of the internet, the availability of music, all of all of that really, that's changed a lot of stuff. And, I mean, first of all, it obviously changes. Uh, it allows me to be a listener to your radio station, even though I'm a thousand miles away, or someone True. in Australia who's five thousand miles away, right? Yeah. But also, Absolutely. it change. It probably changes where you are able to get. Uh, content from where you're finding music to put on your show Mm. and also it has most definitely changed the way that music is being released and the way that you see labels coming and going all that kind of stuff why don't don't you fill me in a little bit on the effects that you see from the music side well anytime you talk about what's happened about uh, the time over which I broadcast, one of the most obvious and largest changes is the move to webcasting. Now, again, listener-sponsored radio is really different. We actually had a lot of heartfelt discussions at our station about webcasting because we identified ourselves as local, strongly geolocal. And right. the feeling on the part of some people who were at the station at the time was that uh, if we webcast, suddenly everyone would want to be international stars and we would lose our interest in a local engagement. Hmm. So that, that it, was a really, it was a really serious, heartfelt discussion. So I'm, I'm trying to present the station as the kind of group of people who think about things in that way. They're really interested in, in, in being invested as where they are. That said, it would also be a matter of talking about the rise of what I guess I would consider to be narrow casting rather than broadcasting. Um, the notion that, particularly with the arrival of various kinds of satellite radio, uh, we have um, thousands and thousands of stations that broadcast uh, within very narrow ranges. Now, there, it's not the same; it's not quite the same dynamic as you find with commercial radio. Um, commercial, you know, for commercial radio, music is sort of um, inter-commercial lubricant that gets people to <laughs> kind of like leave the radio on until the next ad comes along. Right. So if you play something that's too far away, they might turn the radio off and that would be bad. Narrow casting is a little bit different in the sense that you don't want to lose your audience, but at the same time, you're encouraged to a greater and greater degrees to um, work within a specific genre. So you'll have like the dubstep serious channel or the uh, the bluegrass serious channel those are not bad things in fact actually i've i listen to the, all of them i even listen to the online gregorian chant channel <laughs> that my friend brad garden turned me on to there's another one that's all bird songs you know so that's kind of great it's got its place but i see what i'm involved in doing as different than the narrow casting stuff in fact i'm kind of the opposite i see a lot of what i'm supposed to do as finding uh, an, ex- an accessible exemplar of something that points people to uh, the opportunity to find out about something outside of that. So I feel like my job is to point at specialists. And I, I came to that over a long period of time because I was trying to find a good rationalization for the fact that I, I felt anxious about Oh, I don't know. This would have been about 10 years into broadcasting. I suddenly said, oh, this is terrible. I'm only playing things I like. Like, oh, man, this is like really terrible. These poor people are stuck listening to me playing my 10 favorite records. Of course, it wasn't 10. But the idea was I wanted to uh, kind of work outside of that. And I wound up deciding that what I was going to try to do was to sort of program by timbre. But something like that. I wanted to find some... I, some kind of loose idea that, that wasn't ge- necessarily genre-based around which to organize a program so that you could wander back and forth between forms without particularly upsetting people. I have a young woman now who listens to my show who's been on my case about this thing recently, and I'm, I've really been thinking about this the last couple of months. She uh, has said 
I really love your show, but you know, there's no people in it. And I thought, well, wait a second, it's full of people. <laughs> and I think what she meant was there are not a lot of singers. Oh, I see. Right. That's, that's what I think. It's that the terrain is not organized by genre, but pe but the human voice is not at the forefront of what I do. Mm -hmm. I never thought of that particular semiotic as being involved with being no people. Right. But I do right. think what I do think the thing that she does correctly intuit is that I'm trying to make a sort of space for listening that's not homogenous, but sort of has some sense of of movement about it. So I would say that microcasting has been uh, an arrival that's been kind of good for me because that's the thing you get to, to point to. I don't play dubstep, but if I did, I would find the best piece of dubstep I could. And every time somebody called me in, it called in and said, this is great, I'd say, okay, this is called dubstep. Uh, go look for it. Oh, in right. fact, there was, a, there was a British band called uh, Bark Psychosis, one of the great 90s British sort of quasi shoegazer bands that when that band split up one of the guys in the band started doing drum and bass under the name boomerang and it was mm -hmm. awesome drum. it was really good drum and bass and that was what i would do with that thing i didn't play a lot of drum and bass but when i did or I, you know maybe rome or something when i did i people would call up and i'd say that's called drum and bass that's a whole genre there's there's hours and months worth of listening to this stuff go get them or you could do the same thing with computer music. Right. So the one question I have about that, though, and, and it goes back to something you said earlier. You, you made the statement that you like to treat radio shows like music or art pieces, right? You kind, you, of, you kind of develop them in that way. And I've kind of talked to you when you've been in the middle of putting a show together, and I've kind of heard that happen. I'm curious, how, you, how do you balance things when... If, if that's one of your goals, part of it then is to sort of like have a voice, right? Have a voice that people know when they hear you that it's you. I mean, one of the worst things you can do as a musician is to be able to play all music, right? Yeah. I mean, it's nice to be able to, but you don't want to do it, you know? Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so similarly with a radio show like yours, I mean, how, how do you balance saying, here are my personal choices? I mean, you touched on it here a second ago, but how do you develop newness and, and newness for yourself as well as for your listeners while at the same time maintaining that voice that hopefully Ugh. people are going to use to uh, determine if they're going to be an avid listener? Well, doing, uh, doing new stuff does affect your status as a trusted agent. Right. That's true. Uh, it, at some point, I started attempting to play... Um, let me think if I can think of a, of, a, of a classic example where my deciding to include more of something really upset someone. Oh, yeah, I know exactly. Okay. So at some point, um, I started... I, I was looking at a lot more... Uh, what you'd think of as procedural composition. There's a period of time in the, in the 60s when that's uh, a very big deal. Explain that a little bit more, what that means. Procedural composition is something that was fairly fashionable in the 1960s. Uh, there are still people who do it, but that's really when it started in earnest, where you know, to generate a piece, you basically, you basically describe a series of actions, or you set up a structure. Or the thing that you work from to create the structure of the piece would be graphic material rather than specified notes. Okay. So I decided I was going to do more of that stuff. And that led me back to a lot of really early Morton Feldman. And of course, yeah. once you play early Morton Feldman, you really want people to hear the, the work he did toward the end of his life. Unfortunately, since so much of that is three hours long, you, you have a sort of limited set. But um, So I started working on this stuff. And there was, a, there was a woman who was one of my listeners. I presume she was a grad student because she's gone now. But she had the most unerring ability to identify Morton Feldman of any human I've ever encountered. And, she, and, and here's the thing. She hated Morton <laughs> Feldman. Oh, yeah. And it would be, and the, call for, the call that I would get from her would, would be uh, preceded by something like, Oh, sweet Jesus. This is that Morton Feldman stuff again, isn't it? <laughs> and, and it got to the point where I would like try to find stuff that I could fool her with. 
and I'd find unusual versions of Fort Feldman's graphic scores, or he wrote this really quiet percussion piece called The King of Denmark. There's a bunch of recordings of that. And I'd try to sneak a new one on. She could find it. So sometimes you do that, but more often than not, um, I guess I tend to think that I sort of listen, I kind of listen in a straight line. And I think that it's possible that there are, uh, that the jumps occur because somebody aims me at something that I didn't know about. And let me, while I'm just talking idly, I'll try to think of an example of that. But by and large, I tend to trust the people that I listen to. And when individual work winds up kind of collecting other works around it as a genre, I tend to listen to that. So uh, an example of that would say be Chris Watson's uh, work using site recordings of sound. Mm -hmm. His stuff is... And so I guess we'd also talk about Bernie Krause. Right. He used to be in Beaver and Krause back in the old days. They've become uh, recordists of the natural world. And they basically make pieces that uh, will do things like compress in it the audioscape of an entire day. Or in the mm -hmm. case of uh, Chris Watson's really powerful work, do things like here is what the island upon which an Irish monk, St. Cuthbert, lived in the nth century would sound like. That stuff oh, right, is right. just really compelling. And sooner or later, that goes, that bleeds into a genre. So now we have, say, phonography, right? right, Which is people who basically construct pieces out of those site recordings. And now, actually, that stuff has worked its way into kind of, there's this new newer kind of chamber ambient that we associate with a very specific set of labels, and it'll it'll pretty much be like watery pianos. Uh, there'll almost certainly be a cello, synth pads, um, and uh, sight recordings, recordings that yeah. the sight recordings that are EQ'd, so they sound like they're being played on um, uh, a cylinder recorder, right. and that's like the genre. So I I am interested in the way that that stuff kind of moves and modifies, and I think that's one of the reasons where playing new stuff isn't really that complicated. Or, uh, since you program by timbre, um, the certain, certain kinds of acoustic space will be similar, right? So if you program something, uh, a new release from, say, Erstwhile Records, it's a great label. Mm -hmm. Erstwhile Records has no reverb. Mm -hmm. like the stuff is just like flat. Okay. It's sitting right on the surface of the speaker. That's part of, I, I would say, that's part of its aesthetic. But you don't do that and then play uh, a live recording from the Royal Palace at Makunagaran in Indonesia because it's going to be big and wet the, and full of insects. Clash, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so that, now, one, one question I have is, you just mentioned labels a couple of times. Um, it used to be that for me, and quite frankly still is, that... I use labels as references for further things I like. So I got into um, Alden Novo, and um, then, you know, that introduced me to the Raster Notan label, which I love everything they do, right? You bet. And so that's just a, a peculiar uh, instance of a label serving as, a, as an introducer of stuff. Is that still how you do it, or, do you, or have you found other means by which you get clued into stuff? Oh, good question. Um, I would say that there are, well, maybe books is a better way to put it. There are authors that I buy in hardback. Right. When the book comes out, it's, uh, it's on my desk either the day it comes out or whenever... Uh, Amazon or Powell sends it to my house. There are uh, there are artists and labels that I do that that I do that too. But absolutely, positively true. One of the things I guess if we're thinking about change over time, one of the things that's really changed has been um, uh, what I guess I would think of as curatorial positions more than anything else. So one of the changes uh, from the middle 1980s to the middle 1990s that has to do with this idea of curatorial stuff uh, was the death of the New Music Distribution Service. Um, it was a clearinghouse for a whole lot of individual, pe oh, individual people. I dealt with them myself as an individual person. So they sort of collected stuff. And although they were all over the map, and maybe that was one of their financial difficulties, they were a trusted source of curation. So if you're looking for cool, weird stuff, 
you would go to the NMDS catalog and just go through and try to find stuff there. When that went away, it took a long time uh, for things to settle. So I think in that interim, I got used to the idea of uh, trusting labels, that okay. curatorial association. Mm -hmm. um, there are labels that are strongly curatorial, ECM obviously being right. one of the big ones, sure. right? But they were kind of the places, first, first one that I actually thought of in that way. Yeah. I think in some one of the other contemporary ones we could think of would be the Nun Such Explorer series, which did for ethnographic music what ECM did for a certain sort of European chamber jazz. Right. More recently, curatorial labels that we have now that continue, I think, to be great would be labels like Dust to Digital, who are uh, tireless in their pursuit of interesting uh, cultural minutia from our past. Uh, they have a box set of 78s from Southeast Asia from the early part of the 20th century called Longing for the Past right. that will take the top of your head off. They're about to put a box out of Paul Bowles' live recordings in Morocco that he did for the Smithsonian in the 1960s. They, they're just tireless in that pursuit. Um, but there's also a sense in which uh, there are little... If, if you're interested in kind of what places that are curatorial, the other place that I suggest that people look would be labels that combine the sales of their own work with work that's like it. So uh, I mentioned erstwhile records a little bit earlier. The erstwhile records website um, not only sells uh, work that uh, John Abbey initiates as part of the label, but also things that kind of hover around in that same territory. He's really careful about what he includes and what he suggests. Right. Uh, there's a label in the UK called Fluid Audio that does uh, does really interesting kind of work, I would say, in that sort of uh, neo-ambient chamber territory that has uh, a great selection of interesting work. So there are places, there are places to look um, that handle that curatorial stuff, but now... Um, the range of stuff is is so broad that you really have to be uh, guided by stuff that uh, stuff that works outside of that. It seems to me, and you can tell me, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there isn't more stuff being released now than there ever has been, but it sure seems like it. I think that's fair. I think that's fair, and I think that there's also. Um, I think that the I think that the move toward Electro, especially electronic work and especially certain kinds of improvisation as becoming a kind of folk music is now complete. Mm -hmm. And a consequence of that is there are, uh, there are a billion folk singers and um, they're all kind of competing for space. Right. And the difficult thing for me has been there's so much of it and um, some of it is sufficiently self-similar that I don't feel as if I feel as if I've had better success looking for interesting work by uh, paying attention to details and asking my friends right. and, and so here's something that people will probably some people out there may be upset about my talking about but I'll do it because I think it's kind of straight ahead I think one of the things about the rise of things like Facebook is that we now have uh, place, places where people post uh, their own work, which is great. I don't have a problem with that at all. As somebody who goes through it and listens to it, though, and watches it carefully, it's really problematic. First of all, because people tend to post things that are like other things. Um, they post, here's the mix of my piece for today or last Thursday or something like that. The work kind of uh, groups in ways that don't lend itself to the idea of physical pieces. They may not see their discourse as being like that, but there's like that. And when they do announcements for it, they look like they're trying to imitate somebody else's press releases. That the, the press releases are just as bad as commercial press releases. And any of you who have read commercial press releases know how hard they are to write and how bad they usually are. They're just depressing. And you sort of think, well, if you're doing your own work, you could probably do a little bit better than that, maybe. But the problem for me has been, if you sort of know what the territory of a genre looks like, it's going to be harder to find somebody in that territory that's personally compelling. It does happen. But I tend to do better 
with, uh, well, one of the other things that, that marks those groups, and I've, I've actually gone into a couple of them and, and grumped about it. They're sort of exercise, you know, narcissism is not the right word, but it's a whole bunch of people in a big room shouting and pointing at themselves. So if you listen to their work, you haven't found any, anything about what they value, uh, what their interests are. There's, there's nothing about anything other than, this is my thing, yo. Mm -hmm. And my, I tend to locate work. That trusted agent model is, is still valuable. In fact, it's the thing that, to me, it's the thing that replaced the old evil, there are only seven labels in the world thing. Right. Because the problem with the old system was there are only seven labels. They're evil, and every once in a while you get somebody who was kind of good. We think Cl Clive Davis was great because Clive Davis could listen to a whole bunch of things and find stuff that was great. And I don't think he was that great, but th you get the idea. Sure. For me, the thing that's replaced the death of that system, which I do not want to return, don't get me wrong, is the trusted agent thing. And a lot of the, the space that's like a million miles wide and a half an inch deep it's just not a satisfying place to fish. I would much rather be sitting in a bar uh, and listening to a conversation at the edge of a table. Oh, uh, in fact, I'll give you two. Here are two things that I found out completely by accident that are astounding. Um, uh, the first one comes to me by way of uh, my friend Vance Galloway, who works in a very different field than I do. He's a great front of house sound guy, somebody you believe and listen to. So Vance says, "Well, I heard this record that's really great," and he dropped a name, James Ginsburg. Uh, and again, since I do broadcasting, you have to know that James Ginsburg is half of a band called Empty Set that does kind of uh, post techno stuff. Okay. And so I sort of know what James Ginsburg does. So Vance is kind of we're sitting around having a drink. It was, I was in Seattle at the time, I think, sitting around having a drink. And Vance says, you know, so do you know about James Ginsburg's other thing? And I'm like, no. What, James Ginsburg's what? And I'm thinking he has a drum and bugle corps. <laughs> because that's the sort of thing that Vance would like, right? And he says, no, no. Um, he actually did this guitar song kind of post-folk record under the name Faint Wild Light. And my first thought was like, no, you're kid you know, it's sort of like, yeah. And did you know that he plays bluegrass banjo too? Right, right. It was just such a bizarre little story that I thought, this sounds really kind of interesting. So I went and found it. It was mag a faint wild light. It was magnificent. So I, I wish the internet gave me more than that. Here's another one. Those of you who are really sick of dubstep, I know that there are people that aren't, but those of you who just find dubstep annoying. Um, probably are aware of the fact that it's kind of it has some subgenres that followed it that were based on the idea that people got really sick of doing dubstep. <laughs> right. So one of them is bass music. Mm -hmm. So there's this guy that runs a, a, a bass label called Hemlock. His name was uh, Jack Dunning, and he he's he does a really good job of that kind of stuff, and it records under the name Untold. So I. It kind of knew his work, and, and I was uh, I was someplace sitting around, and and a bunch of people at the end of the table were complaining about dr drum and bass, and somebody said, well, you know, there's a few like ex drum and bass guys that do great stuff, like that that Dunning guy for Hemlock, and then all of a sudden somebody says, well, did you know that he's like doing modular synth stuff now, and I'm like, what? So uh, suddenly my ears like perk up, <laughs> right? And right. I'm like, what modular synth stuff? And, and I, you know, I like scoot down to the end of the table as quietly as I can and say, wait, 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 you mean modular synth stuff? Like what he does as untold, as his, you know, stuff. And the guy's like, oh yeah, you know who that guy is? And I, yeah, I do. And he says, yeah, no, it's, it's like analog synth stuff. In fact, he's like putting this thing out on like a USB drive and there's only a hundred of them made and blah, 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 blah. But there's this, uh, so the Japanese version of his uh, album Black Light Spiral has a disc in it that's this um, analog thing that's it, it's fantastic. Wow. And so that's how I heard about that guy. You know, it's sort of like that's kind of the stuff that you do. You have, you have your friends. And 
one of the first things I do when I meet when I meet people who are willing to admit that they listen to my show, I have two questions for them. The first question is what you know, some version of what would I what should I be doing more, what should I be doing less? But mm-hmm. the question that comes after that is what's the last thing that you heard that either took the top of your head off or the more the simpler and more sociable one to say is what's the last thing you heard that you like so much that you acquired a physical copy of or right. you paid for? Yeah. And that's always the, that's like a great way to find uh, to find new stuff. Interesting. Well, <clears throat> that's awesome advice and an awesome insight into how you uh, how you pick material. One final question, and then um, I'll leave you to your day. There's going to be a lot of people listening here who are like, "Wow, it sounds like Gregory's show." speaks to me and speaks about me and uh, yeah. but I don't know any of his friends how do I get his attention cuz remember you started off this whole adventure by hauling some of your music as well as other people's music hauling him down and finding a willing recipient in a uh in a radio station who was willing to take a listen right yeah how do people how do people approach you in a way that isn't annoying, or and maybe not you, maybe in the general case. How do people, what's the way to approach someone in a position to, to be a cultural, uh, a cultural detector, right? Mm. How, okay. does, how does someone approach them in a way that is useful for that person and, and isn't annoying? Right? How how can how can someone approach you with music that may be may be useful for you will indicate in some way that you know you are that that you might be interested in? and that mm. doesn't annoy you in the whole hey I've got a fabulous release and I'd like you to hear it press two to continue <laughs> you know? mm. yeah you know that's a in some respects, the answer, I think the answer to that question is a little bigger one. And that is, um, we, there's a tendency in our culture as people who are makers of things or um, competent individuals to think that our work somehow speaks for itself. It's not uncommon to have people come to you for a job for example, here, here's an example that's not about programming, but I, I think it, it has something to do with um, that idea. Somebody comes to you for a job and says, I'm the best uh, thoracic surgeon in the universe, and you, you obviously need a thoracic surgeon. I'm not sure that the, that the neighborhood in which I work is those people. What I, what I find myself doing is I tend to trust work done by people whose ethos I understand, rather than the work itself. Um, maybe because I'm not the sort of person that's automatically uh, compelled by every single thing that I hear. That's a consequence of listening to a lot of stuff, by the way, and it's sort of an unfortunate part of... Uh, there are two unfortunate side effects of having to do programming for other people all the time. One of them is, it's not that everything sounds the same, but that it's easier to categorize things right away. And the really bad one for me is... It's really difficult for me to make my own work because the minute I put a sound down, I think, oh, now I'm it trying to sound like, like X, right. right? Yeah. But but the idea is, and and we do this with jobs. You, um, I'm more. I guess I'm more the kind of person. If I were an employer, I would hire from my user community. Right. I wouldn't hire based on the best resume that came in the door. Right. And that's a really diff- that's a really difficult thing to tell people who are basically trying to make the work because in some respects those kind of if I'm a curatorial programmer think of it like a curatorial record label you're forming long-term relationships uh with people whose work you release mm-hmm. and the really complicated thing for somebody on the outside of that is if they're not your friend then you can basically figure something like well they only put their friend stuff out that's not true but it's more like the the thing that informs that relationship is a shared aesthetic. If all you're going by is the surface feature of something, it's not always possible to like understand exactly what that shared aesthetic is. And for programming, the same thing is true. Um, 
at some point in, at some point in time I was involved in, in uh, a record label. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about that was really interesting is we thought we'd set a fairly uh, broad range of what could be done. And what happened with the work that we got in, as often as not, was we got something that was like the last thing we put out. <laughs> because it was as if we'd given creators permission or the understanding that we didn't mind that kind of stuff too. So all right. of a sudden we get more stuff. It's like that for listening. Sure. So what I tend to do is uh, I'm much more comfortable if I know something more about the person. It's one of the reasons that we find, com- that's one of the reasons that you go to hear live music is you want to see the context of the work. You want to, you want to embed it. Of course. Because in some respects as a programmer, what I want to do is kind of like, find a version of that embedded stuff that's interesting, put it on the air as a thing to potentially attract someone's attention. And once I have their attention, I can say, this is a great piece of work, but you know, it's part of a bigger cultural discussion. Yeah. It has so a neighborhood. It has a neighborhood. Yeah. Right. And I do better. I do better with work that comes to me by somebody who lives in the same neighborhood. Right. That might be a tremendous, that might be a tremendous tremendously awful position for me to be in. I know there are people who don't. There are people who see themselves as uh, taxonomists and anthologists. Right, right. John Schaefer's show, New Sounds on WNYC, is a great example of somebody who takes uh, his uh, sort of taxonomic and anthologizing responsibilities very seriously indeed. It would be cool if I were that guy. I could maybe be that guy in like one or two little subgenres, but no, that's not me. So it's more... Uh, who you listen to, right? And who you listen to is often decided by things that ex- you know sort of move in a straight line from what you like. Um, and of late, particularly with um, submissions from other people, it's been really interesting to see people who basically there are people who listen to my show for a long period of time before they actually give me anything. They right. say, you know, I actually think it would make sense. You know, you wouldn't hate what I do. Right, right. It's, that's a little more Midwestern way to put it, but the idea is, <laughs> is that now that I get what you're doing, yeah. uh, I sort of understand. Or people who basically say, I'm re- sorry, I can't really send you this. So for a long time, um, and this is still an issue for some stuff, there, uh, there was a, a briefly a period of, of time where there was a successful genre, which was referred to as lowercase. Right. And lowercase stuff was ridiculously quiet beautiful work it had much of it had to be digital but it was astounding work the problem with lowercase was i couldn't play it right and the reason i couldn't play it was i had cab drivers in my audience <laughs> i was going to say it's it, nobody wants to think that they tuned into a, a blanked out yep. station well it, well so here's another listener sponsored community radio thing people if people think the station goes off has been has gone off the air they call us Oh yeah, what happened? Yeah, right. that's right. Or, or they're they're very helpful. They say, "I'm I'm really sorry. I think you're off the air right now. <laughs> there might be something wrong with the transmitter." <laughs> yeah, that's ex- no, that's ex- and and believe me, back in the early days of the station, when our transmitter link was, uh, how do we say this, a good deal less reliable than it is now, that was not an uncommon occurrence. <laughs> So people would call it. So when I did certain kinds of like really quiet music or stuff that had like lots of, of embedded silences, people will call you up. So this, there's a new uh, a new recording from um, uh, Keith Rowe and John Tilbury. Uh, it's called uh, it's on Sofa and it's called Something Enough Not to Know. The, the whole piece is three hours long, but it's basically like little tiny gestures with large amounts of sound in between. Uh, improvisers like Taku Inami, same thing. You play if I play those, people are afraid the station goes off the air. Right, right. So I, I tend to not play them as much. Sure. But by now, longer term listeners know that that know that that's the that's case. That's a possibility, right? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Sure. <clears throat> so that's really an amazing story and, and trip. A question for you, just because we have to wrap it up, and I appreciate you taking the time. It's kind of blown right through here. I had a bunch more questions, but I'm just gonna. Wrap it up with this. No, one. it's fun to talk. It's fun to not have to talk about myself all the yeah, time. Yeah, right. That's great. Well, this is great. It's it's interesting for us to have you give us clues about places to go listen to. Well, I can still. I've got some more if you want them. <laughs> well, here's here's the big clue I want from you. 
your desert. So you have listened to more stuff than probably anyone I know personally. What's your desert island five? Oh, I have only the slightest idea, and it would be this, it would be different next week. Um, so I, I guess I have to not think. Yeah. Um, Just blurt five out. Because <laughs> really, the ones that the yeah the ones that surface are probably going to be the ones that your gut is telling you are important anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, music for airports. Steve Reich's Taylim. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, and I'm thinking if I have to have five, they're going to have to be different. Music for Airport, Steve Rice's Taleem. Um, Tangerine Dreams, Phaedra. Uh, Super Silent, five or six. Uh, Jivan Gasparian's I Will Not Be Sad in This World. It's an Armenian Dudek record. How many is that? That's five. Unreal. Oh, and the Bach and the Bach B minor mass. Joshua <laughs> Rippert's version of it that has only one voice per part. Oh wow! If you've never heard it, uh, and, and you if you're oh, committed to the creamy, like giant numbers creamy version of Bach stuff, but you can't yeah, yeah. tell what anything is doing, right. the Rifkin single note B minor mass will change your life. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I great, hope it's okay that point. I put the B minor mass at the end because it's uh, of those five pieces of music. That's the piece of music that I listen to more than the other four. Unreal. Fantastic. Yep. Well, thanks so much, Gregor, for your time. I appreciate it. It was great hearing, you know, hearing a different version of our discussions. But um, I just want the listeners to know, almost any time I talk to you, it has that kind of engagement. I always enjoy our discussions, and I want to thank you for your time. Uh, no, thank you. And um, I guess we can put up a link to the show. Well, in fact, actually, yeah, we can. So uh, thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks, man. Yeah. Catch you later. See ya. Okay. Many thanks again to Gregory for his time talking about what life is like on a 30-year-old radio program. I want to thank everybody for their continued support. Thanks for giving me a week off last week. We got the house prepped for sale, and it looks like it, it already sold. So... That's a good sign. Um, Those of you in the Minneapolis area, watch out, because here I come. Other than that, uh, thank you so much again for listening, and I'll catch you next week. Bye.